Today I want to look at endangered languages, languages that are in danger of becoming extinct, of disappearing, uh, much like species are endangered and can go extinct, the same thing can happen to languages. Uh, every species needs to continue to create new offspring and new generations to continue to carry its genes and live. And the same with languages, languages must be transmitted uh, every generation. Uh, it's, it's a continuing process that you know, every new generation of speakers has to learn that language and it's not something automatic. For any of the larger languages in the world, we can kind of take it for granted that they will continue. But for many smaller languages, there is certainly no guarantee. Uh, so looking at the idea of endangered languages, you can see that the, they are, uh, you can take a look at this, this map here showing the blue regions. Blue regions are the regions with the most linguistic diversity, having many small languages. See, a lot of the other regions of the world, they, they've already been, uh, been sort of more thoroughly saturated with a single language uh, or a few major languages. Um, and this map is highly simplified. Of course, there is a lot of diversity all over. Uh, and there are many languages outside these areas. But this shows where a lot of the endangered languages uh, are focused. You see Mexico, Brazil, uh, see in West Africa, particularly in Nigeria, uh, in these parts of uh, northern India, and Indonesia and Australia, as well as Papua New Guinea, uh, which has uh, considered to be the most linguistically diverse uh, place on, on Earth. So looking at endangered languages, the, the main source and consider the, the authority and standard is UNESCO, the Atlas of the World's Languages in Danger. So they have uh, sort of have this classification system, quite similar to what you would see uh, for endangered species. Uh, so you have the everything from the safe level, which would be all the world's major languages, up to languages that are completely extinct. So we just have these varying levels of endangered. We can see, let's take a look at you know, what that might look like to be one of these endangered languages. You can maybe take a look at uh, an example from each of these levels. So for safe, there is no special list of safe languages, but you can simply look at you know, a list of languages ranked by number of speakers, uh, and for the most part, they will all be safe. Although it is possible for a language to have a large number of speakers, but for all those speakers to be quite old. Uh, and in that case, the language could still be in danger because in, there must be, for a language to be living, it must continue to have young speakers, continue to be born and learn the language, and carry it on generation to generation. As soon as that generational transmission ends, the language ends. Uh, but generally for almost all the uh, languages with many millions of speakers, uh, they are not considered to be in danger. Of course there is pressure, like languages like English and Chinese, you know, at the very top of the, the scale, like they can become quite dominant and there's high pressures for uh, many people to learn English or Chinese or one of these very few top languages. Uh, so languages that are sort of in the second tier or third tier below that, there is possibility that in the future they may decline significantly. But all those languages that with, with many millions of speakers, like there's no immediate horizon uh, expected for them to disappear. They still have many generations, presumably. Um, of course, no guarantees. But this is about ranking these languages by and you know, choosing which ones to focus on as being the most in danger. So those would be considered safe languages. So now let's look at the first level of, uh, of the first level of the endangered category, which would be vulnerable. So they're not even going to call it endangered, but just maybe that it's you know, at risk of being endangered. And so I'll pick a random language here. 
And we have duet, the duet language in Papua New Guinea, spoken by 400 people. So I'm surprised that this is only considered to be vulnerable because that's quite a low number. But you can see some of these languages, like, you know, if this is only the first level of endangered, you know, some of them are going to get, get pretty extreme. So, yeah, here you see it's listed as the, in the vulnerable category. So the highest level of endangered or the least level of endangered. And um, very short little entry, not much uh, said about it. We have a few of their, their words thrown in, some numbers, um, but that's it. And you can look more into this, you know, this particular area. You can see the location within Papua New Guinea. Um, and okay, it's also influenced by, there's, oh, it's, it has this neighbor language, Nabak. Okay, there's a bigger one, 16,000. Okay, but that's, that's a level one vulnerable language. Okay, so how about, well, here we switch from vulnerable to definitely endangered. So I guess vulnerable is kind of like saying maybe endangered or, you know, in, it's vulnerable to becoming endangered. But now we have uh, something that is certainly endangered. So I'm going to pick a random uh, language. Let's say Kadaru. So that's interesting that you know, we've gone from a language with 400 speakers that's only considered vulnerable to a language with 25,000 speakers that's considered to be definitely endangered. So that's why we look at the, the social conditions, the, the place where they're living. Like maybe that, that language, that duet language in Papua New Guinea, 400 speakers, but they maybe have, you know, they're fairly stable situation. They have a community that's, you know, in a certain place, they're staying there, they're able to continue and carry on. Um, there's nothing immediately threatening them, perhaps. And uh, so they, they have, they can be considered to be a fairly robust language community. Well, just the fact that there's only 400 of them, you know, is enough to make them be considered vulnerable because that's any population that small, you can consider it to be vulnerable. Uh, but now here we have a language of 25,000, at least in 2013. Um, but this is considered definitely endangered. Possibly there's more, there's less of a socially stable situation, less of a sense that this community will continue to speak this language for sure. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, the Nubian, yeah, so it, it's a hill Nubian language. So it's part of the Nubian uh, language family. Um, spoken in the Nuba Mountains. Or maybe that's what Nubia is named after, or maybe that's a similar name, I don't know. And in, in the south of Sudan. Okay, so, yeah. Interesting that consider the Nubian language was once used as a lingua franca. Okay, but it's not clear that it's this particular version. See, this is a, this is a version of Hill Nubian. So the, the Nubian languages are the overall family. And then this is, uh, you know, within that, this is one particular language in the Hill Nubian branch. Um, so I think this statement here about the lingua franca, that's a bit of a stretch since it's referring to Nubian overall. But of course, yeah, the influence of Arabic. So usually like a lot of these, these languages, and I guess you can pick pretty much any of these uh, niche languages, there's gonna be a more powerful language nearby that's going to be uh, an influence. And um, of course there's English around the world and Chinese not too far behind, but uh, then there is, um, there is in, in uh, all over North Africa here, we have Arabic, uh, so that would be, the main language that would be competing. So you can imagine the, the pressure that like a lot of these speakers may, there's a lot of advantages to speaking Arabic rather than speaking Kadaru. Okay, so yes, yeah, so here they're just, it's described as like there's six clan groups on six separate hills. Yeah, like how when you get to these niche languages, like you really see, like you, get, you really zooms in on this local area, like it seems like Duet is like maybe a particular village in Papua New Guinea, about all those 400 people in one village. Here we have, you know, there's six clan groups, like there's six hills, and each hill has its own dialect of this Kadaru language. You can see how the different 
dialects, they even have a different name. Like these are probably related. Like you have Kadaru and Kururu. And the, so maybe, I mean, those might just be two versions of the same, the same name there. And, so, and the whole thing about, you know, what counts as a separate dialect versus a separate language, that's a whole other area of, of debate. Uh, and uh, there's definitely political factors there that uh, can influence whether languages or dialects, whether they're considered to be languages or dialects. Although typically, I mean, the standard is generally, are they mutually intelligible? Can speakers of one understand the other? Uh, as is certainly the case with English, you have like, you know, you have like uh, British English versus Australian English versus American English. Generally, mutually intelligible, although there are some exceptions where, you know, sometimes uh, some versions of English are pretty hard to figure out. So yeah, there's no hard lines there. But anyway, uh, that's the Kadaru language considered definitely endangered. You can read about lots more information about this one. See if there's any, yeah, so it's describing the language, the pronunciation. You can see it has, uh, there's Arabic influences on it, Arabization, etc. Okay, so now I move on to uh, the severely endangered level. And here we have a list, okay, so we'll pick Let's just go the Acheron language. I'm curious about that. Oh, we're going to be back in Sudan. We're still in Sudan. Yep. Yeah. So we're still South Kordoban. So this is, yeah, right on the edge of Sudan and South Sudan. Um, and you can see that, okay, this language is part of the Niger Congo family, um, which is, yes, this course, it's, there's a lot of debate about, you know, what counts to be. Uh, part of this giant language family, which covers most of Africa south of the Sahara. It includes the, the Bantu language family, which is the pink here. That's the, the main one. But there's some other uh, families around. You see there you have uh, the little dot up in Sudan there. It seems like it's even uh, separated from the rest of that family. Um, so I, I think there's, it sounds like there's going to be some room for debate about whether it really belongs to that language family. But anyway, um, here we have, okay, we have 20,000 speakers, but just under 10,000 in the home area. So that would be, the, here we have a case of a large diaspora. So yeah, imagine you have a population of 20,000 and half of them have dispersed. Uh, so that's really quite a large, uh, you know, dis dispersion and distribution around the rest of Sudan and the world, leaving only half in the home area. So I'm sure that that has to be part of uh, the issue why this is considered to be severely endangered. Yep. And again, not too much uh, information about it. We have a lot of consonants, but uh, yeah, not too much about the language otherwise, at least here. So here we have severely endangered. So you can see like the number uh, the number of speakers is a factor, but uh, there's really, it's really a judgment about the, the social situation uh, that would, uh, you know, be considered, um, that would be considered as part of the decision for how it's classified. Yeah, it's interesting that this word Asheron Come, it comes from Arabic, meaning innocent people. How interesting. But they call, them, they call themselves the Warame. And they're called, they call their language the Gurame. Okay. All right, so now we go to the critically endangered level. Now, this is on the edge of extinction. So uh, let's go for Itonama. Okay, so now we have... Ooh, this is not looking good. So when you get to critically endangered, things are looking really grim. Um, so uh, when you have here number of native speakers, one in 2012, like this one, in fact, here, the way it's being described, um, it is once spoken. Like that's not sounding good. It was spoken. Um, so this one, you know, and here we have only a few elderly people remember a few words. So this is a language that it appears to be all but extinct. 
Um, and it probably already is by now. Sorry to say. And what do we see about it? Yeah, like, you know, these languages, when they disappear, here's a few words like, you know, we'll go down in history that we have the, you know, this list of consonants and we have a few little notes about the grammar and we have this little short word list. And it's quite possible that a language like this will you know, disappear from history except for these, these little snippets of a few words could be all that's left uh, of this language. But in fact, like, I feel like I want to, uh, I feel like I want to uh, open up another one because that one I think is already extinct. I want to look at one that's still critically endangered but not yet extinct. I think Itanama is probably gone. Let's look at, okay, let's, yeah, here we go. Let's, well, I don't know. See, the, these critically ones, you know, they really are close to the edge here because now you have, yeah, Susuami in Papua, Papua New Guinea. Um, and we have 10 speakers over 20 years ago. So we had 50 speakers estimated in 1980. See, there were other languages spoken even inside the same village. Um, and then, so of course there are debate. Yeah, the, like the, there's there's talk pisin, which is the English-based pidgin that's used around Papua New Guinea. So that would have uh, that would be a competition because it's more you know more useful in a widespread area. But even within the village itself, competition. So that is looking that is not looking good at all for Susuami. Its continued survival is unlikely. Yes, that this one is on the way out. So. Is this really what, is this really, uh, you know, the, is, is this the fate of any critically endangered? Possibly, you know, here, Turaka, possibly extinct. How about Udege? Udege, okay, here we go. This is me, so here we have Udege, language of the Udege people. Uh, this, so this is in, in the Tugusic family, this is far east Siberia. Uh, and so, now we have the, yeah, so 100 speakers in 2010. And you can see this area, like the far, the, yeah, the far eastern uh, end of Russia. And you can see a uh, writing system based on the Russian alphabet. A lot of, a fair bit of information about it. Some, some examples. A fairy tale um, expressed in this language. You can see different writing systems uh, to express the language. But yeah, with the language of yeah, with, with a population of a hundred uh, in 2010, um, you can see this one. Although it is slightly better off than the previous two I looked at, it seems to be also on the way out. So really big jump when you get to critically endangered that uh, you know, it really becomes uh, on the edge of extinct. And finally, we will look at example of an extinct language. So, well, let's look at extinct languages by time, languages by decade of extinction. Okay, languages extinct in the 2020s. So we'll look at language that was recently went extinct. Let's say Akakari or Akachari. Kari, oh, here, oh, maybe Kari. Okay. Extinct a great and oh, this is on the Andaman Islands in the uh, in the Bay of Bengal in the Indian Ocean, uh, which so re a really isolated uh, island group, which has its own language family apparently. So, the whole language family appears to be nearly extinct, um, and here you have. Uh, it was considered to be extinct, they can actually give it uh, a date, and that's because they identified the last living speaker. Uh, so here we have, yeah, so they were around, the you know, population, by the population, by 1994, the population was reduced to two women over 50. Uh, and and the, the few other survivors of the other um, Andamanese language family speakers. And so here we have, we have her name is Licho. 
Licho was one of these women, and she died on April 4th, 2020. And that is the end. That is the end of this language. So, yeah, always a little sad to see the... Uh, a little sad to see the the end of a language, just like you know the end of a of an endangered species. That uh, it's something that once was a unique and living thing in the world, and now it has disappeared. And that seems to be the fate of this whole language family. So, looking around at the languages of the world, there really are a very large number of languages that are in this position. Just like with endangered species, there's a lot of them that are under threat, and it's the same with languages. Uh, and uh, it seems like this process will continue. There are efforts to revitalize and revive some of these uh, endangered languages, and there have been some stories of success, uh, but for the most part, there's increasing consolidation in the more major languages. Uh, as the world becomes more, even more interunited, global, globalized, uh, and interrelated, uh, with greater communication and integration, that favors a smaller number of languages because these languages can be used over you know, wide areas of the world. Whereas in earlier times, when people were more isolated, in their particular areas, then it was quite natural for there to be a different language in each village along the way. Uh, but now, a few languages uh, cover huge uh, swaths of the earth. And it seems like this will probably continue, and the number of languages that will uh, continue to live will be much reduced. How much? We don't know, and there are efforts to keep linguistic diversity alive. Uh, but yeah, this is a very real thing that is happening very quickly right now.